This is a recording from a Sunday meeting of the BC Humanist Association in Vancouver. Humanism is a progressive worldview that, without supernaturalism, affirms our ability and responsibility to lead meaningful, ethical lives capable of adding to the greater good of humanity. To learn more about humanism and to support our work, visit bchumanist.ca and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to the BC Humanist Podcast. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of our staff or board of directors. Charles Ross is a nurse who recently completed a PhD thesis in SFU's Department of Health Sciences. Her research looked at substance use practices amongst nurses across Western Vancouver. Her work highlights the prevalence of 8A or 12-step based practices despite participants' disagreements with the moral and religious basis. She has interrogated some of the forces that have led to the dominance of 12-step treatments and what alternatives exist. Please welcome Charlotte Ross to our meeting today. Charlotte? So I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am a nurse practitioner and I'm a faculty instructor in the Bachelor of Science Nursing Program at Devers College in Coquitlam. And the research that I'm doing, or have done, and I'm continuing to do, uh, that I'm presenting today, is on um, part of my PhD thesis work. And uh, there's an assignment Fraser University Health Sciences. Uh, also, just a little housekeeping, there's no conflicts of interest to declare for my research, and all of my funding was obtained through private resources and through uh, SFU student grants. There's a contact there for anyone who does want to get hold of me. And I'm just acknowledging that this presentation is taking place on unceded Coast Salish territory, which is the shared lands of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. In order to understand um, what we're going to talk about today, which is some of the ideologies that have organized or underneath the nurses' programs that manage their um, the regulatory programs that manage their substance use problems, I need to give a little bit of background of how I entered this study in order to make some sense of my findings for you. So historically, the background of this is the regulatory policies were enacted to protect the public from impaired nursing practice. And for many years, literally from Florence Nightingale up to the 80s, was an approach that we refer to as the historical discipline or punitive approaches. And what this was when a nurse was identified as having substance use problems, she or he was subject to a very strict and severe disciplinary process whereby they lost their jobs, lost their licenses, were prosecuted if there was uh, theft of drugs involved, and um, the, this situation was made public. As a matter of fact, just as an aside, I can remember up until 2012, um, turning to the back of my CRBC journal to see who was off for substance use of my colleagues. This became referred to as the throwaway nurse syndrome because the nurses were lost to practice, lost to the system, and it was inhumane. In about the 80s, the approach in general, for the general public, for substance use problems became more health oriented. The substance use problems were viewed as a health issue rather than in the historical approach, they were viewed as a willful misconduct and punished. So in this alternative to this discipline approach, which I'm going to be referring quite a bit to, they're viewed as health issues, as all health issues are confidential, and they're voluntary programs, the nurse changes her license to an inactive status, which any nurse can do without penalty, and the goal was the recovery um, and return to practice of the nurse. That's the goal. So in addition to protecting the public, this had within it a supervised treatment program that the nurse was supported through. So this was the focus for my work, is that particular supported um, treatment program or regime within an alternative to discipline structure. So just additional background is that despite the alternative to discipline approaches having far, far higher uptake, voluntary uptake by the nurses, and program completion rates, uh, many provinces and many states still have the punitive and historical, uh, sorry, the punitive and disciplinary historical uh, approaches in place. Um, I think Canada only has two now uh, that are alternative to discipline, the rest are punitive. So the focus in the nursing literature that I found was completely centered 
upon trying to convince uh, jurisdictions to change to alternative discipline, even though it's been well established. And in the meantime, in the states, there's the National Council of State Boards of Nursing established guidelines for that treatment program within the ATD processes. However, as that document states itself, no verified best practice standards have been established for these treatment programs, yet they enacted these guidelines. That's important throughout my talk. The benchmark outcome measure of these treatment programs has been program uptake and completion. So that was how it was determined whether or not they were successful. That was the marker of success in the literature. And myself and other researchers found that there had been no comprehensive studies on the overall effectiveness of these standardized treatment regimes. I'm going to talk more in detail about what the track standardized treatment regimes include. Um, just also some historical material. So that National Council of, um, of Boards of Nursing in the state, they established those guidelines in following the uh, more extensive and longer standing treatment program for the physicians. It was called the physician's health model. So the nurse's model was based upon this physician's health model. However, a systematic review of that model, the physician's model, showed that they were unsupported by scientific evidence and that the existing studies were of poor methodological quality. And another researcher found um, significant conflicts of interest inherent in the studies evaluating the physician's programs. But the guidelines were based upon these. So what is that standardized treatment regime that is both the nurses and the physicians? It's standardized and it's based upon a traditional model of addiction, addiction treatment, a, a historical model, which involves 12 step as treatment, complete abstinence from all psychoactive substances, psychoactive substances um, meaning ones that act upon people's mental states, emotional states, uh, et cetera and compliance monitoring. So monitoring their compliance to the abstinence. The term monitoring is used, I like to be more specific than that because what you're actually monitoring here is compliance to the established regime. And that's uh, completed by means of routine random biological specimens, usually urine tests, sometimes hair samples. And just for further context, there are no existing studies that compare either the nurses or the physician's treatment models to any other treatment modalities. So this is in isolation and has not been compared to any other regime in the literature, but it is now the standard for both nurses and doctors. So what I did in my research is I focused my study on um, a treatment program of a new alternative discipline program in a Western Canadian province that I will refer to in that way. Um, I then narrowed my focus to the processes because it's a huge network of processes that involves the nurse, uh, their employer, and there's many employers in the province, the regulatory body, which is the body that provides the nurse with their license and allows he or she to practice, and um, the union, and any number of moving parts in between. So the reason I narrowed my focus to the procedures and processes within this whole program that um, that are limited to the regulatory body, regulatory body and the nurse is because nurses in the province all have different employers. Um, they don't necessarily belong to the union. For example, I don't belong to BCNU, I teach and belong to a different union. And um, the regulatory body has the, the capacity to provide a nurse with her, her or his license so every nurse in the province needs their license to practice. So that was my rationale for narrowing to that focus. Um, throughout my talk, I'm going to just refer to the part of the program I studied as the program, for brevity's sake. And um, when I interviewed um, the program administrator about this new program, they said that they, because uh, this was 2012 when they enacted it, is they based it on the NSCBN guidelines and they viewed it as cutting edge. So that is the context um, for my study. And my research aims is I wanted to describe the nurses' experience of the program from their perspective. I wanted to describe and map the institutional processes of the program. And I wanted to discover the underlying ideologies that organize these institutional processes and how those institutional processes 
and ideologies organize the nurses' experiences of the program. So what I did is I interviewed 12 nurses, registered nurses, one was a registered psychiatric nurse, um, who were or had been in a provincial program, a specific provincial program for regulation of nurses with substance use problems. I interviewed three program administrators, and I'm going to use uh, various participants' quotes throughout my talk, but just so you know that pseudonyms are used for all the quotes. I'm not going to get into detail of my methodology because I'm, I'm guessing that's not what, um, what you guys want today, but I'll just give a brief overview, and anyone who wishes to learn more about my methodology um, can talk to me later, and I'm very happy to have that discussion with you. So the methodology I used was an institutional ethnography analysis where I interviewed, uh, sorry, oh, I'm going to back up, I missed something. I also retrieved and analyzed relative, re relevant institutional documents that were used in the program. So I analyzed the interviews and those documents, and I paid particular attention to the discrepancies between the nurses' experiences of the program and the official accounts of it. So these were my findings. Okay, so what I did is, as I said, I started with the different accounts of the program. So here is an official account, is an excerpt from the, the regulatory body's website, and they have a case study, which I don't know if it's fictitious or not, it doesn't say, where they provide an official account of a nurse's experience in the program. Okay. So this is um, an excerpt from a case study on the regulatory bodies website, and I'll read it out. Not big on reading out from PowerPoints, but I will read quotes out for accuracy. Kelsey was diagnosed with a substance use disorder by a medical expert. Her recovery plan includes treatment, connecting with a local recovery community, and enrolling in a medical, medical monitoring program. After treatment, Kelsey was reassessed by the medical expert who reports that Kelsey is in early recovery. She thinks Kelsey is fit to return to work with medical monitoring and supports in the workplace. So then I started gathering data. And here is a nurse's account of the program. Uh, her experience of the regulatory program. The way I experienced it, it was being forced to side with the abuser or lose my ability to practice my profession. The degree of intimidation I experienced is really difficult to quantify or explain. The constant threat that any transgression, accidental or on purpose, would swiftly and severely be dealt with. I had nightmares constantly, and even hearing about participating in this study nearly gave me a panic attack. The nurse must subjugate herself to their version of reality. Any dissent is viewed as evidence of instability, and there is no way out except total submission. I will say that I am healthy despite this treatment, not because of it. So this discrepancy, this very remarkable and disturbing discrepancy, was the beginning of my investigation to see how this discrepancy, this, these two accounts of the experience had been organized to happen. So just in brief, I'm going to show a little diagram of the program, a part of it that is relevant, and then I'm going to unpack that and answer your questions about this piece by piece as I go along discussing my findings. So this is just a very abbreviated version of what happens in the program, but I am going to go into detail. So. Here's the nurse. <clears throat> the nurse is involved with the regulatory body, the union, and their employer. And there's any number of processes going on there. But the ones I'm focused on here is with the regulatory body. And there's a contract that is signed by the nurse as to what the treatment program and process will be that they will adhere to for the duration of that contract, which is stipulated in the contract in order for them to retain their ability to practice nursing, i.e. their license. So the first step is an independent medical examiner assessment whereby a report is produced that goes back and is the recommendations within that report are central to the forming of this contract. Always, invariably, the recommendations involve a mandated treatment regime, which I'm not going to read here because I'm going to go into a lot of detail later. They finish treatment, come back, are reassessed by the independent medical examiner. They return to work, and then at the termination of their contract, they're reassessed to see if they can terminate it, and then the regulatory body terminates the contract. So I'm going to go into a lot more detail following. So, so the first thing I'd like to discuss is that whole process of the mandatory assignment of the independent medical examiners, or IMEs. 
And it's important to draw your attention to the fact that this is um, this this is mandatory. And the the IMEs are very important in this procedure because their, as I mentioned, their reports and recommendations um, determine basically the nurses' contracts, the content determination of them, their ongoing licensure status, their return to work. And the assigned IMEs are limited to a select group of what is termed of in, in the program as addiction physicians. Contract the nurse has to sign with the regulatory body so that she or he has their license. And within that contract is the recommendation, recommended treatment program, i.e. you will adhere to this, this is the contract, and you can practice. The treatment program. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the treatment program in, in just a few minutes. What exactly it entails, but I'd like to bring your attention first to the assignment of these doctors who make the recommendations that are uh, central to the contracts for the nurse to have her license or his license. So these particular physicians are a small group of select physicians, and they are deemed to be the experts. These are the words that are used and specialists in addiction. Um, I just want to also bring your attention to the fact that the uh, Canadian Medical Association does not confer any specialty in addiction medicine. The physicians involved are general practitioners who have a cer certificate from the American Society of Addiction Medicine, but they are deemed to be the experts and specialists. That language is used in the document. Without exception, all the participants, nurses and the program administrators, reported that the IMEs were confined to the same treatment recommendations, which included 12-step abstinence and monitoring. Also, these treatment recommendations are consistent with the standardized physicians and nurses models that I referred to in, that was in the literature. The requirement that a nurse be assessed by an independent medical examiner is different than the requirements the regulatory body has for nurses who have other conditions that could impair their practice. For example, if a nurse has a seizure disorder, obviously that can impair their practice and they have to have some regulatory management of that, but it is handled very, very differently. Or for example, type one diabetes. What in those cases, the nurses are able to select their own healthcare provider, or if there are concerns, there's a mutually agreed upon healthcare provider. The rationale that I was provided for this choice in the program rules, I can use the word rules, I think, is that they felt there was a need for the separation of assessing and treating physicians. I will talk more of how this is confusing because in my estimation from my analysis, they were not separated in actual fact. And I was not given uh, a reason that I, I wasn't given actually a reason of why it was necessary to have assessing and treating physicians that were separate. So there are some real discrepancies between the stated rationale I was given and what was actually happening. Also what is concerning is collateral information from nurses, personal physicians or healthcare providers were ignored or disqualified. And just for uh, non-medical folk here, that is not normal practice because if you're performing an assessment of somebody, you want as much data as possible from family members, from their own physicians, their own nurse practitioners, whatever. You try to get as much data as possible on the person to make a complete assessment. However, that assessment was not only not sought out, it was disqualified. So the normal procedure, in any case, if you disagree with a doctor's opinion, is you get a second opinion. However, in the program, it didn't really work like that. The second opinions were only accepted from that designated group as well. And here I have somebody's experience of that, a nurse's experience. I was told you can go out and find another physician to get a second opinion, but you're going to have to pay $2,500 for your own money, and we can't really guarantee you that we'll accept his opinion. We have five or six other physicians who are the only physicians that you're allowed to see to get an opinion, and they also make the exact same recommendations as the physician that you saw. So I don't believe I'm overstating that this is a Kafka-esque circular process, that there really is no means of protest. I'm gonna get more into protest in this end. So this standardized treatment regime um, invariably includes strict abstinence from all psychoactive substances. So that means that if somebody only had problems with alcohol, they could be seen in violation of their contract if 
um, in their urinary screen, they had certain medications that even were legitimately prescribed, like benzodiazepines, etc. So it was all psychoactive substances. The nurses were assigned to a designated residential program, which is one of two in Ontario private facilities that are called step based. They had a minimum of two to three week, two to three per week. Uh, requirement of attending 12-step or caduceus meetings, and caduceus meetings are um, peer support groups for healthcare providers, substance use, and technically they are not 12-step, but my participants told me that in practice they were conducted in a 12-step format. Um, compliance monitoring, which is biological uh, urine testing, which is at private facilities that were assigned to them. There was also I was told it was important to send them to those facilities by the program administrator because they they provided a monitoring function in addition to the, the urinary monitoring. And so when I drilled down into that a bit, I found out, like I said, who were the monitors? Well, um, they're vetted and hired by the monitoring companies and the regulatory body did not know what the qualifications were. And from my participants, I heard different um, qualifications. One was it was the wife of a physician who owned the company. Others were um, people from AA who were hired. And um, I had one participant who was severely chastised for even asking. They also, in this monitoring, would ask standardized questions that were then sent to the regulatory body. Um, how many 12-step meetings you've attended? Um, how are you working the 12 steps? Which step are you working on now? now right? I'm just going to uh, talk about 12-step for a minute and the literature, what the literature says about the efficacy of this. Um, although the 12-step model, I will admit and fully acknowledge, has been helpful for many, many people, a Cochrane uh, collaboration study of 12 steps, and for those of you who aren't researchers, Cochrane collaboration studies are considered the highest quality of evidence, um, and others have concluded that claims of 12-step superiority over other methods or using it to the exclusion of other uh, methods are unfounded and unsupported by the scientific evidence. Also, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, um, in case that sounds familiar, that's the body that gave the certificates to the physicians, do not consider peer-led support groups to, and lay sponsors in self-help organizations to be providers of professional treatment. Nevertheless, um, the nurses were required to demonstrate what was termed in the documents as treatment engagement. What that means is they were expected to organize their beliefs in accordance with the 12-step principles, be shown to be believing them and acting them out in their daily life. And the 12-step belief system, um, if you're not familiar with it, sees addictions as a result of flawed morals and character, and the recovery from those addictions is relinquishing one's personal power to a higher power that will correct these flaws. <clears throat> when it, what I found in my data is when the 12-step method was ineffective in assisting the nurses, for example, they couldn't attain or maintain abstinence, this was framed as treatment resistance, which was very much viewed as a personality or a moral flaw rather than as part of the disease pro, uh, process. Um, those of you who are familiar with more um, evidence-based public health approaches, relapse is considered an uh, expected part of recovery from addictions. However, in this program, it was viewed as resistance to treatment. And um, here's a, one of my participants. We were told in the residential treatment that if the 12 steps aren't working for you, it's not the fault of the 12 steps, it's the fault of yourself and your flawed character and your character defects and that you're not working the program properly. When a nurse relapsed or uh, had a uh, urine specimen that was negative, or so positive, this was addressed by mandating more 12 steps, um, <coughs> encouraging them to redouble their efforts at applying the 12 steps, increasing monitoring, which the term used was enhanced screening, which I'm a clinician in mental health and addiction and I've not heard that term otherwise, uh, which was framed as an actual therapeutic intervention. And this possibly and likely delayed their return to work or lengthened their contracts. So I have treatment as submission and dissent as disorder. So submission to the dominant ideology, I also found when I dug down into the NSCDM document, the one that I referred to earlier, the guideline, um, 
the submission to the ideology as therapeutic was entrenched in the guiding document. And I'll just read it. Denial is the chief characteristic of all addictive diseases. Once in the treatment process, the denial normally fades and the participant can begin the process of admitting and accepting. So whereas, uh, like I said, I'm an addiction clinician, uh, denial or lack of, I prefer uh, lack of insight into one's substance use problems is definitely a characteristic in many cases of people with substance use disorder. In this program, it wasn't framed similarly. It was framed as uh, submission to the dominant ideology, and denial of that was unacceptable. So in the literature as well, if not in addition to my data, nurses' recovery was synonymous with compliance. For example, as I referred earlier, completion or retention in the program was seen as success. There were no outcome measures of how nurses felt, or whether they felt their recovery um, was, was occurring and how it was occurring. So ultimately, in the program, a nurse's fitness to practice was organized as compliance or submission to the dominant ideology in the program. Um, also, some other data. Darbro found that nurses, so if we're just looking at completion, if we are even accepting that as a benchmark, nurses were far less likely to complete the program if they saw no value in peer group uh, processes, they felt victimized by a coercive treatment process, or they were not permitted legitimate prescription medications. I'm going to talk more in depth about that particular point in just a moment. Also, um, Urbanowski found that uh, mandated compliance with imposed ideologies cannot be considered accurate measurements of commitment to or of actual recovery from substance use problems. And even if we are looking at the 12 step itself, um, mandating 12 step violates its own principles because the fundamental principle of all self help is choice and wanting to be that. Um, so, if I'm uh, talking about these as, which I am, outdated um, approaches, I just want to give you some context as to what current evidence-based treatment programs are for those of you who aren't clinicians. So, the, in current practice with the general public, treatment plans are for people are individualized as opposed to standardized. Um, they're collaboratively chosen as opposed to imposed. And they include any or all, um, it's, it's commonly called a menu of items that people can choose from. So harm reduction or abstinence, cognitive behavioral, motivational interviewing, individual counseling, and peer support, which includes secular as well as 12-step options for people. And importantly, in current therapy are different pharmacotherapies, including opioid agonist therapies. So those of you who don't know, opioid agonist therapies are things like methadone, suboxone, probably hearing about those in the news right now. So the ideologies that were in the program effectively ruled out evidence-based treatment. For example, the prohibitionist mindset of the 12-step abstinence model ruled out legitimate pharmacotherapies to treat people's not only addictions, but their existing mental illnesses if they had them. And I found that um, that was okay. they were ideologically viewed as reliance on crutches rather than as treatments. Nurses in some of the cases of my participants were encouraged or in some cases mandated to alter or discontinue previously legitimately prescribed medications for their psychiatric conditions even when their personal psychiatrist tried to intervene. The calls weren't even taken in some cases. None of the participants in my study had been offered pharmacotherapeutic treatments for addictions of any kind. So just to give it a little more context about opioid agonist therapies, because there certainly are nurses who um, have uh, dependence on opioids. So in the general population and treatment right now, these are strongly, strongly supported by evidence. And I have some data here. They're generally recommended as a first-line intervention for opioid dependence. And something I didn't put up is that detox or withdrawal from opioids is not indicated. People are offered opioid agonist therapies as a first line. They show demonstrated uh, treatment efficacy over abstinence and they markedly reduce incidence of death from relapse. Interestingly, they are explicitly endorsed in many of the nurses, the, their own employers, for example, Vancouver Coastal Health. And what 
I found particularly interesting was the Canadian Nurses Association, the, regula the national regulatory body, strongly endorses and has a physician statement endorsing opioid agonist therapies, but the nurses themselves aren't given them. Um, I did hear sort of colloquially that the reason is is because they don't want these drugs to impair their practices. However, there is data, which I have cited here, that there has been evidence of these drugs successfully treating healthcare professionals without impairing their practice. Also, um, the ideology in this program overrode nurses' basic rights to dissent, to protest their care, and to their rights to quality and ethical care. For example, um, obviously I was interviewing uh, nurses who are educated, aware, healthcare professionals who know what is in their professional obligation. And the nurses themselves identified they are expected to adhere to standards of practice, ethical standards of practice, and professional care standards of practice in providing care to their patients. However, these um, standards were denied the nurses in the program, and some of the specific ones are the right to client-centered and collaborative care, autonomy in healthcare choices, receipt of care in accordance with one's own religious beliefs, knowledge or evidence-based practice, harm reduction is a standard, as I mentioned, and trauma-informed practice, which is client control, choice, empowerment, and patient's trust in their healthcare providers. Uh, just a little aside, at the time of my data collection and writing, um, of those five and six physicians, none of them were female. And I did have a number of females in my participants very uncomfortable with that. So looking at the power structure within the program, um, literature has shown that lack of choice in nurses treatment regime has been detrimental to their actual recoveries. And when I, when I asked what happens if nurses dissent or protest, I was informed that the program was voluntary. This is what the nurses are informed of. And given the choice to comply or be exited from the program. Being exited from the program means you then go to the, the historical disciplinary and punitive approach. Um, so the program administrator said, it's a consensual resolution agreement, so you can agree to it or not. If you don't agree to it, they have the ability to send the matter to a hearing, is the, the official account. However, another administrator said, they are called agreements, but that's not what these are. These are imposed coercively. There are consequences if you don't sign one of these. You can't return to work. There's not necessarily voluntary consent. The nurse has everything to lose. They are 100% reliant on the physician for their livelihood, and they're alone in a room with them. I would think that they would be just at risk for abuse, exploitation, whatever. It's a very dangerous situation for people to be in. And one of my female participants said, I was in a new job. I didn't want to be outed, so I would have done just about anything. So that tells me quite a bit about somebody's feelings of vulnerability and actual vulnerability. So another thing I found that was quite disturbing is the regulatory body outsourced the power over the nurses to the physicians because they were the ones that actually held the power over the nurses as a regulatory body. But they outsourced that and they abdicated from any oversight of it. I'll unpack that a bit. I also found, interestingly, that they very much abdicated and deferred to the physician's decisions unless they didn't appear stringent enough. I asked the uh, program administrator what would happen if a nurse asked for an alternate treatment plan. Then they're probably going to have some challenges with the regulatory body. The inquiry committee, that's of, uh, a statutory committee of the regulatory body, reviews the INE's reports for the quality of the information and follows the advice of the physician so long as it makes sense to us is clear and reasonable. If we have concerns, we'll ask these questions to the doctors. However, when I asked about the composition of the inquiry committee and asked if they had any expertise in addictions, the quote was, they did not necessarily have to have any specialization in substance use or addictions, but that would be helpful. So, some obvious questions arose for me. I didn't understand how they could understand the merits and the shortcomings of the various approaches the traditional model, the more harm reduction, or have any knowledge of those, how they could critically appraise the IME's uh, reports or adjudicate whether alternative treatment plans were reasonable, if you remember the previous quote, they have to be reasonable, or even know what questions to ask to do that if you don't have any preparation, educationally or clinically. So then I also, and 
your comment, Dan, I know there. Um, looking at the corporation, corporatization, pardon me, of the program and conflicts of interest that I found in here in this process. I discovered a number of uncontested dual relationships, potentials for conflict of interest and abuse, and no mechanism to address these. So somebody asked uh, earlier, what do you mean by the person's comment about abuse? I think we're getting there now. Um, if I can just give an aside when I'm talking about the dual relationships, when I looked at the College of Physicians and Surgeons guidelines for IMEs, so a physician was going to act in the role of an IME, there's specific guidelines for that. And they state clearly that the purpose of an independent medical exam or examiner is, quote, to determine the health status and functional status at the time of the examination, not for discussion of treatment and directs the IMEs to confirm that the patient understands, quote, that treatment advice will not be given. So if I can ask you to recall that in the IME's reports, our treatment recommendations entrenched in that that are then what makes the nurse's contract. I also found nurses that were encouraged to attend the fiducious groups that some of their IMEs led. So some of the IMEs were members of the 12-step community, as a matter of fact, several of them were, and led these groups. And the nurses couldn't be um, mandated to attend those particular ones, but it was made very clear to them that that was an expectation. And when there's that much power, I don't think they're going to argue. So back to Dan's point, and several of the IMEs held financial interest in the monitoring companies that the nurses were assigned to and required to utilize. The IME's reports were central to the decision of terminating those monitoring contracts as well. So I questioned that, and I asked what the regulatory body's position was of these perceived conflicts of interest inherent in this process, and they told me it's up to the physicians to regulate their own conflicts of interest. So um, the person said, yeah, we've had discussions with some of the physicians, and they put firewalls up between their practices, independent medical evaluators, and, and me. What are the firewalls? Well, you'll have to talk to one of the doctors. That's not something we can go. <laughs> and the participants certainly raised, as did some of the program administrators, very serious questions about the efficacy of that self-regulation. Again, I'll read the quote. I was seen by the IME. He got $3,000 to do his assessment of me. When I returned from treatment, he assessed me again, $1,000 for one hour, and set up my return to work contract, which included mandatory enrollment in the monitoring company, which he is the medical director and co-owner of. That enrollment was six fifty a month for three years. The first year was paid by the union, the second two years was out of my pocket. They make a lot of money off nurses who are in their monitoring program. It's a massive conflict of interest and somehow no one addresses. So as far as corporatization, the program consistently and inexplicably, inexplicably bypassed the public health system in favor of the for-profit private system. It was organized in ways that uh, that created and maintained a substantial and reliable revenue stream for these companies. Um, for example, the IMEs were engaged through their private practices for the initial and ongoing assessments. The mandatory residential treatments were the two private ones, even though um, I did have participants who requested to go to other evidence-based ones in the public system and were refused. And the assigned monitoring companies, again, were private for, for profit. Um, the, also, the inquiry committee's lack of expert knowledge, I felt, and was very concerned, left them very susceptible to persuasive corporate marketing strategies, and very real potentials existed uh, to incentivize conflicts of interest and to insert corporate imperatives into the nurses' treatment process. So my conclusions, um, treatment and recovery were organized as compliance to the existing regime. They were based on outdated understandings of substance use disorders as moral or character failings, inconsistent with current norms of practice, um, rife with subjugating power relationships, conflicts of interest, corporatization, and that nurses were not afforded the same right to quality and ethical health care as other citizens. My recommendations that have come out of this are to ensure that nurses have the rights equal rights to quality and ethical health care as other citizens, and their offered choice of evidence-based um, treatment alternatives, and to integrate 
healthcare professionals, including nurse practitioners, I think, um, but there's other ones, psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors that are qualified, um, that the nurses know and trust and to provide a choice of these healthcare providers. Enfranchise oversight and a fair and just appeal process into this program. Install nurses into decision-making capacities who actually have knowledge about addictions as treatment and to utilize publicly funded services. Um, so um, in my PowerPoint, I have some related works by me if you're interested and um, also some relevant items I'll just draw your attention to if you're interested in this topic. Um, there's a recent CBC article that has interviewed a nurse who is uh, taking this whole process to the Human Rights Commission. There was very recently, in the last month I think, the Interior Health Authority Substance Use Policy um, was challenged and the arbitrator ruled uh, very strongly in favor of, um, um, uh, uh, strongly against the health authorities uh, position, which is very similar to what I've explained to you, so it's a, it's a positive thing. And there's also a petition, if you're interested in signing it, that uh, Byron has put up, Byron Wood has put up, uh, to try and get evidence-based treatment programs for healthcare professionals. Um, one more aside, in the last week or two, Ontario just did this fanfare announcement of their brand new shiny spanky uh, treatment uh, program for nurses. I did the research I could on the public domain, and it's a new alternative to discipline, but they said in it um, they are basing it on a tried and true treatment process, so I'm not um, optimistic. And I have my feelers and emails out to try and talk to somebody to find out the particulars, but I haven't yet. So that's just some final comments. So anyway, thank you for your attention.